Science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. Hi, I'm Juliette Selgren, and this is my podcast, The Great Antidote, named for Adam Smith, brought to you by Liberty Fund. To learn more, visit www.adamsmithworks.org. Welcome back. Today, on October 4th, 2023, I'm excited to invite John Bitsan to the podcast. He is the Menard Family Director of the Sheila and Robert Challey Institute for Global Innovation and Growth at North Dakota State University. Today, we're going to be talking about a recently published survey from the Institute that demonstrates somewhat and somewhat not shockingly that my generation is... I. <laughs> I was thinking down to clown and cancel, but that's kind of a silly way of saying they like to cancel their professors slash are afraid of being canceled themselves. But we're also all okay with canceling each other. Um, And there's more to it than that, I think. And and so maybe that part doesn't come as a surprise, but I think the fuller picture will and maybe the implications and it's worthy, worthy of a discussion. So welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Juliet. I appreciate it. I'm excited to be on. So first, what is the most important thing that people in my age or my generation should know that we don't? I think that's a good question. And so one thing I think is that uh, people that are young uh, should understand, and maybe they don't, is that they should really take advantage of the co-curricular, extracurricular activities that are available to them right now. So they have opportunities to you know, travel internationally through study abroad programs or to join student clubs or to listen to speakers. And later on, it's going to be difficult to get those same opportunities. And I think they'll regret it if they don't take those opportunities now. So just as an example, at our institute this last year, we had a Nobel Prize winner speak. Uh, we had uh, Sam Peltzman, who's a pioneer in regulatory economics. Oh, wow. We had Glenn Wait, that's Murray. cool. Yeah, Glenn Lowry, a leading expert in race and inequality. Mark Mills, energy and technology expert. I mean, so these are opportunities for students not only to hear these speakers, thought leaders, but also to engage in one-on-one conversations with them. And when they get older, if they don't take advantage of them now, those opportunities, they'll say, man, why didn't I do that? And so I think that's something I realize now, you know, that there are opportunities that I didn't take advantage of when I was younger. And I guess advice to my younger self would be to take advantage of them. So that would be my same advice to to young people today. Yeah, that's good advice. And I'm going to use this advice as an opportunity to ask you for some more advice, especially as an economist. Um, I've been thinking a lot and talking to a few of my friends about the issue with with time and stress, right? Opportunity cost. Um, yeah. We want to do it all, but we have so little time. And especially in college, when there are so many opportunities, it's kind of hard to, I don't know, keep the world in perspective and to kind of realize that I can take the time to go to this random lecture that is not a part of a class, not homework, not something I necessarily would put on my resume. And so I guess as an economist and also as as someone who is giving this piece of advice to capitalize on these opportunities, Do you have advice about how to execute that plan or how to keep it all in perspective? I mean, I I think that's an excellent point you're making. I mean, obviously, there there are opportunity costs. um, But I mean, I just think that um, some of the things you could think about are from an economic standpoint, think about building your human capital. And so if I, you know, I could maybe I'm giving up the opportunity to relax or or take some time for myself instead of you know while i attend one of these speakers for example um but i'm learning a lot by going to this speaker and it's something that even though it's not going to show up on my resume um it's an experience that i think that i'm always going to treasure it's an experience that uh, i will learn from which is going to build my you know build my skills and and help me be a more well-rounded person think of different perspectives. I, I think maybe some of the, I mean, I know that the the opportunity cost is really in front of you right now, very obvious, but maybe some of the benefits are are not as obvious. And so if you're to take a strict, you know, benefit cost calculation, should I go or not, it might not look like you should now, but then 
some of the benefits you'll realize later on um, that you realize that you did get from it that maybe you don't realize right away. So that that's I, maybe I danced around your question, but that, that's that's the best I, advice I would be have is just again you can't do everything, but if you have a Nobel Prize winner coming to campus, I mean. That's something when I was, I got to see a Nobel Prize winner for the first time in my 40s. And it was at a conference when there were, I was in a room with like 500 people and I didn't get within, you know, 50 feet of the person. And I was super excited. It was Gary Becker. Um, oh, but wow. yeah, I mean, but, but I mean, these are opportunities that students can shake, you know, Vernon Smith's hand and, and ask him about, you know, what was it like to win the Nobel Prize? And just, I mean, it's something that, it, it'll it'll be a story you can tell your your kids and grandkids later on as well. <laughs> yeah, no, I think and, and trying to put this in economic terms, which I don't think is the most helpful necessarily, but it's trying to embed the other periods of the game that is your life, if we want to call it that, um, yep. in the current time period. I don't know if that's even economics for me, just trying to. Yeah, well, that, yeah it is. I mean, so, I mean, so that you're getting at the concept of an extensive form game and, and backward induction. And so again, so you're, you're, you know, you're looking, but I mean, you're, I don't, I think most people don't, don't think the way that you're thinking, Yeah. I mean, which is, but it's really, I think that's a good way to think about it is that is you're thinking about, you know, some of the future benefits as well. And I, I think that's important to, to consider. And I think in a way, like maybe we'll get to this, especially as we get into the problem and then potential solutions, that this is either either the way of thinking, like this mode of thinking in terms of what are the potential non-resume human capital and not in the terms of, oh, well, it'll better my human capital just in terms of me getting a job, but my human capital in terms of who I can be for myself and those around me. Um, I think that that part becomes relevant in talking about not just free speech, but the point of the university and the state of conversations at the university, I think is maybe the way I want to say that. So yeah, let's yes. jump in. Yeah, great, great point. I was just going to say, like, your your human capital, that's a good way to think about it. It's not just your jobs, but you want to be a more well-rounded person, a better, a better citizen. I mean, so I think that's a great point. <laughs> Thanks. I've been working on it. I tried to, so I'm TAing for intro micro, and I'm trying to explain to my students that utility is not just happiness and that human capital is not just labor. Um, <laughs> and so I've been so I've been working on it. Um, awesome. uh, OK, so writers, intellectuals, thinkers, mostly but not always on the right, have been saying for a while um, since like before covid even even before like 2015, right, coddling of the American mind, things like, quote, professors are walking on eggshells around their students, end quote, or, quote, college dissidents are afraid of cancellation by their peers, end quote, or, quote, censorship is running rampant on college campuses, end quote. And we have a country, especially in the intellectual parts, in the substack and the podcasts, we've been talking about the alarming state of free speech, but can you lay out what your research, particularly this survey, has added to our understanding of the situation on college campuses and why it's so important? Is there something you've been wanting to try but haven't quite been able to give yourself the push to jump outside of your comfort zone? You keep telling yourself, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. And before you know it, it's been a year or maybe five well, you're not alone. Join me, Danny Elliott, as I talk with guests from all walks of life about their first time doing something on First Time for Everything. We talk about first time writing a book, to becoming a parent, being on Broadway, starting a business, and so much more. Head over to First Time for Everything wherever you get your podcasts and hit that subscribe button so you never miss out on an episode that just might inspire you to try that thing and who knows, maybe even change your life. Uh, yes. So, so I think uh, our our survey and we did survey with College Pulse. We did this survey in collaboration with them and we surveyed 2,250 undergraduate students at four year institutions across the U.S. and 131 different universities. Uh, none of the students were at North Dakota State University where, where I am. Um, but I think that uh, 
this survey increases our knowledge of you know what it what kind what is the atmosphere for free speech on campus and i know there's a lot of surveys that are are out there looking at this i mean fire and heterodox academy and others have you know surveyed students but we have some different things in here and and i think um you know some of the things that come out and it's not just free speech i should also mention that we also our have a our survey also assesses students' knowledge of human progress, and also assesses what do students think about socialism and capitalism. Um, I know that there are a lot of surveys that identify you know students souring on capitalism and being attracted to socialism, but usually those surveys don't ask how students define capitalism and socialism, and that in turn affects how they view them. And I think that's a unique aspect of our survey. But in terms of the, the free speech part of it, um, I think that uh, some of the things that come out um, in our survey is that I, I think this is, it's very obvious. Uh, we had done this survey three years in a row. This is the third year of our survey. And one of the survey questions that comes out at, that really just shocks people when they see it is that students are very willing to want to report professors for saying something that they think is offensive. And so, uh, and consistently over the last, you know, three years when we've done the survey, uh, you know, in excess of 70% of students say that if a professor says something that they deem to be offensive, the professor should be reported to the university. Um, and in previous years um, in our survey, you know, we've mentioned that fact and and people say, well, what if the students are thinking that maybe professors are going to say something racist or they're going to, you know, harass people or personally attack or threaten people? And, and that's a good point. And so this year we've actually changed uh, or added an additional item in the survey where we ask, ask a series of opinions or facts related to affirmative action police shootings, guns, vaccines, uh, and gender or sex. And we ask questions on both the right and the left for each of these. So, for example, we ask for vaccines. We have one that says something like, uh, if if uh, people refuse to get vaccinated, they're being irresponsible. And then on the other side, we ask something like saying that requiring vaccination is an assault on personal liberty. Um, and then we asked students for all of these 10 um, different opinions or facts, which of these should professors be reported for? And we find that 65% of students say that professors should be reported for saying one of these opinions or facts. And so, in fact, it's showing, I think, better than other surveys that students really don't want to, I mean, many students anyway, do not want to be exposed to opinions that they disagree with. And I think this is very alarming. I think it's something that is one thing to point out the problem, which we're doing in this study, but I do think that hopefully it causes action at universities for, you know, this is an alarm bell that we don't want students who are not tolerant of different opinions because those students are not going to be critical thinkers those students are not also going to help to advance scientific knowledge. We need students to consider different opinions that disagree with themselves. It might help them sharpen their own opinions. It also, um, you know, might have as might cause them to reconsider their opinions. But um, I think it's a really dangerous thing when students are saying there's one set of opinions that's acceptable and everything else we just want to shut down um similarly we you know we ask students uh if another student says something that you deem to be offensive should that student be reported to the university and about 60 percent of students say yes they should be i mean so those are two of the questions that are kind of really alarming but you know there are a lot of other other things you know related to speech and knowledge of human progress and views on capitalism and socialism that I'm happy to talk about. I don't want to talk on too long, but if you want, we can go into more depth in some of those things as well. Yeah, I just, something that that you said that I'm kind of interested in, how does this survey specifically get at capitalism and socialism? Maybe 
what it tells us is that capitalism and socialism as words are buzzwords that don't really carry much definitional weight among people. Um, but how yes. do you get at those concepts without using those words? What sort of definitions do you use? So we actually do, we do use the words, but, but what we ask students is we ask them to define capitalism. And I mean, we give them definitions and ask them to choose. So one definition of capitalism that we ask is we give a free market definition of capitalism. So one choice is it's an economic system in which property is privately owned, exchange is voluntary, and production and pricing of goods and services are determined by market forces. Then we ask a crony definition of capitalism and we say, or is capitalism an economic system in which corporations utilize grants, special tax breaks, political connections, and special rules that favor them over competitors to earn profits? And then we give a third choice of, I'm not sure. And so we find that students, of, I mean, over half, define it correctly as free market capitalism. So over half picked the free market definition, about 56%. But there's 30% of students that define capitalism as cronyism, and then another 14% that don't know what capitalism is. And we find that students that, I mean, m most students don't like capitalism, which is consistent with other surveys, but we find that students who define capitalism as cronyism are way more skeptical of capitalism than those that define it correctly as free market capitalism. Um, similarly with socialism, we give definitions where we say socialism is best defined as, and so we give the central planning notion of socialism. So an economic system, which the types quantities produced and prices of goods and services are planned by the government and property is owned by society. So the classic definition of socialism. And then we give a kind of a hyper redistribution definition of socialism, where we say it's an economic system in which individuals and companies make decisions on the types, quantities produced and prices charged for most goods and services. But the government plays a very active role for assuring that prices are fair and ensuring an equitable distribution of resources between the rich and the poor. Um, and then the third definition is, I don't know. And we find that 44% define socialism as hyper redistribution. Only 35% define it as, you know, common ownership of property and central planning. And, um, you know, and then another 21% don't know. And so, as socialism, especially, I think people don't understand what it is, uh, including Bernie, well, Bernie Sanders, the way he, he, I mean, he probably does understand it, but in his public uh, speaking, he doesn't uh, articulate it correctly. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting because uh, I just read, and I would recommend this book, I was reading the book, uh, Socialism Sucks. I don't know if you've heard, heard of that book, um, but it's- <laughs> No, I uh, haven't. It's a book by uh, Bob Lawson and and Ben Powell, and they travel throughout the world to um, different countries that have aspects of socialism in them, and then they they talk about their experiences. And the last place they go to is uh, they go to a socialist convention in the United States. It's the American Socialist Convention, and they interview a whole bunch of people at the convention. And most people at the convention don't know what socialism is either. <laughs> most of them actually define it as really just hyper redistribution, not as uh, we know that so true socialism really means that property is owned uh, you know, by government. It's not there's no private property. And and most of the people, I think the people in charge of the, you know, that conference understand what it really means, but most of the young people going to that conference don't really know what socialism is. So I think our survey is consistent with that. Um, but again, the way people define socialism influences whether they have a positive view of it or a more negative view of it as well. Well, so I guess a question would be, does it, to what extent does it matter if 
everyone has the definition wrong. Doesn't that not necessarily change the definition of the word per se, but kind of transforms it? Does it influence actions away from just redistribution and towards the actual definition of socialism if people accept the redistribution aspect of or definition of socialism instead of the actual one? Are we still trending towards the actual definition and not the thought definition. I feel like I've jumbled all of it, but does that, does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I do. Well, so one thing, one reason I think it matters is that if we're going to have debates in society <laughs> yeah. about what is socialism a good thing or a bad thing? Well, we should have a common definition that we're talking about. Yes. And that's where some of the things are jumbled up. I mean, so when people talk about, you know, Sweden or the Nordic countries as being socialist countries, and they're like, you know, look at how great it is. Well, that's that's not socialism. Those aren't socialist countries. Um, and uh, and it, I mean, furthermore, there are even, I mean, even if you look at, if you want to call it socialism light, the redistribution definition. Um, yeah, that's maybe a good way to do Yeah, I mean, there's still negative consequences to that as well. And and Sweden's an example where they were, they were even more prosperous before they started introducing more of a social welfare state. Um, and if you, uh, look, if you have heard of uh, Johan Norberg, he has, uh, he has some videos talking about uh, the change in uh, in Sweden and how it was even it was more economically free and more prosperous until they started introducing more of a social welfare state or socialism light, I guess, if you want to call it that, because there's still you still have the negative incentives, uh, you know, for uh, for profits and you have state uh, the state substituting for private entities in in various uh, actions, investment uh, that occur even with the socialism light as well. So, okay, back to, and I guess this still kind of fits in with the whole of what the survey is kind of capturing. Yeah. Um, but part of part of the survey also touches on the ideas of progress or optimism. So yeah. what is the state of optimism in my generation? And does it coincide with free speech finding coincide not coincide that's not a word <laughs> uh yeah i i would say the uh, the state of optimism is is not high <laughs> let's just say that um i i think um i mean so so one of the questions we asked in the survey was we asked and we gave very objective measures we said in in terms of extreme poverty life expectancy, literacy, and hunger. Has the world improved over the last 50 years? Has it gotten worse over the last 50 years, or has it stayed the same? And 47% of students say the world has gotten better over the last 50 years in terms of those things. And this is at a time when extreme poverty in 1981, about there's uh, over 40% of the world's population um, lived in extreme poverty today it's nine percent um literacy has you know, improved 10 percentage points over the last 50 years life expectancy has increased by 12 years over the last 50 years and so all these things have gotten remarkably better yet most students think that it hasn't gotten better um, and that leads to 20 percent of students saying they're optimistic about the future of the world um, similarly, for the United States, uh, we asked in terms of income per person, education level, and life expectancy, has the United States gotten better over the last 50 years? And 41% of the students we surveyed said the United States has gotten better. Um, and again, I gave the 20%, I'm sorry, 20% are optimistic about the future of the United States. It was about 30% are optimistic about the future of the world, but still students uh, are not optimistic about that. Um, looking about at their own futures, um, we found that just about 51% and 52% are optimistic about their own futures and their ability to make a difference in the world. And I think there's some implications from this. One is that if students don't understand the progress that's been made historically, they're going to be less optimistic about the future. I mean, I think that that shows uh, in our survey. Um, and 
although over half are optimistic about their own futures, I mean, these are young people, college students. You would think that this would be the most optimistic time in their lives and their uh, especially about their optimism about making a difference in the world. And so although, you know, it's over half, I still think it should be much higher than than over half. Um, how does this coincide with our, our free speech findings? Um, you know, I don't know if that, you know, if the whole um, not wanting to be exposed to other opinions, you know, I think, you know, maybe, um, you know, if you want to, you know, there are people that say things are better than you think they are. You know, I suppose there could be somewhat of a um, people maybe would reject that point of view because they think that it's they could perceive it as you're not acknowledging any of the problems that we're experiencing. So, I mean, there could be I mean, so I guess there could be an attempt to shut down people who want to say, hey, things actually have improved because if you want to make people aware of current issues, I guess you you want to emphasize that things are really bad right now. So I don't know if that, I mean, if that's a way to relate the free speech findings to the findings on optimism and progress, I, there probably is some relationship there. Something that I've been thinking a lot about, especially so on the lines of optimism, free speech, politics, um, is the way that our most recent presidents have conducted themselves. Um, they've both done things that would have been some sort of political suicide in the past, I think. And they, uh, the way they talk, I hear much less, and this this also might be bias on my part, I hear much less, I'm proud to be an American, um, or even even when they're saying things that are more optimistic, it doesn't there seems to be an undertone of I need you to believe this, um, yeah. which I think is kind of interesting. So do you think that in a way the the whole generational intolerance of my generation to hear dissenting opinions or dissenting from your own um, because I think it kind of exists regardless if you're if you're on the left or the right. Um, yes. And then also this this lack of optimism. Do you think it, it enables a weird tolerance for the behavior of politicians or could it be a result of that? Or maybe they're both symptoms of something even bigger than that? Yeah, no, I, I do think that that's I think all of that is true that. Um, that, yeah, it's makes people tolerant of, of politicians that, that talk that way, but it also, um, yeah, I, I mean, it could be something bigger. I think, you know, I do think again, that, uh, people, you know, I mean, people, if you want to, to point out with the polarization that's occurred, you think about there is increased polarization and social media, I think, um, helps create that polarization to the extent that you continually are reinforced in your beliefs, whatever your beliefs are because of the algorithms, the way that they're set up. Um, and I think that um, then maybe it makes you more critical of the other side. And, and if you want to uh, criticize somebody, then it's helpful to, to maybe uh, point out their deficiencies or think or things that you think are bad and and make them very urgent and so you don't want to acknowledge anything good maybe that um that the other side has done or uh or if there's certain problems that you think are are the most important to you you want to make those problems urgent and and emphasize those problems and not acknowledge some of the progress that we've made in addressing those problems. I, I mean, I think that all could be, yeah, like you say, a symptom of a bigger, a bigger thing in society that's occurring. I think there's a relationship with polarization. Um, and I also just think, um, I, yeah, I do think maybe, you know, events with the, the COVID pandemic and everything is, has been so urgent that, maybe it's, it's caused people to lose perspective on, you know, when people are saying, you know, 2020 was the worst year ever. Well, uh, 
you know, if you know anything about history, you know that it wasn't the worst year ever. I mean, you know, we have, we had clean water in 2020 and, and we didn't have uh, many of the problems that we've had, you know, in history. So, um, I'm not answering your question very well, but I think it's a, it's an important thing to contemplate. And that's a good question. So something I've been thinking about, I mean, I think the bigger question that I think everyone is somewhat dancing around because no one quite knows the answer or has enough information to answer it is, is the symptom, is what we're seeing on campuses with, with the optimism and the state of the world and the depression and the anxiety and the free speech stuff, did that come first and has it kind of broken out and affected the rest of America or is it an American problem and we see it best in the university setting, maybe because of what universities are. So kind of thinking along these lines, one of the things I've been thinking about is that maybe maybe the university doesn't serve its purpose anymore. Um, so it's kind of clear now that the university degree doesn't necessarily guarantee the job that people once thought it did. It's not an investment in the way that it maybe used to be. Um, where it so obviously puts you ahead. You can obviously still get a job. I've been corrected on this front. You can always still get a job, but maybe not the job you'd expect. Um, and so now that a university degree doesn't necessarily serve its most obvious practical purpose, then it kind of easily loses touch with the rest of its function, like being a a haven for the marketplace of ideas, which it should be for academics anyways, but for students, when their purpose is to get a degree and that no longer necessarily serves its purpose, maybe somehow that makes the rest of it fall away in terms of importance. What does it matter if I can have these sorts of discussions if I can't even have a job? Um, and I don't know I don't know if this is like really a true thing or if this is just kind of what I'm seeing and I'm grasping at straws, but do you think that this hypothesis has any merit at all? And if not, why not? No, I think, I think it has merit. Uh, so first of all, I would say the first thing I think you asked about is, is it a university problem or a societal problem? And I, I think it is a societal problem that maybe is, easier to see at, at a university level. I mean, so I think, again, students, one of the things that I think is interesting is that students are not, it seems to be anyway in our survey, one of the things we ask students is, are you comfortable sharing your opinion on sensitive or controversial topics in class? And one of the things we found was that uh, students said that the students who said that they were comfortable, about half of them said they were comfortable because they thought that other people agreed with them. Uh, the students that said they were not comfortable sharing their opinions, 72% of them said that they were concerned that their opinions would be unacceptable to other students. A much smaller percentage, it was still, you know, reasonably high, I think in the, the 40%, 46 or 45% said that they were concerned that their opinions would be unacceptable by uh, professors. And so students are concerned about how other, how their peers view them. And I think that that's very apparent in our, in our survey. And so I think that this is something that students come into college thinking. I don't think that it's necessarily something being taught to them in a university. I think that they, you know, it's before they get to the university that they develop this intolerance. Um, but again, and then getting to your, you know, but I do think that it's the university's responsibility to do something about it. So, I mean, you know, I, I think that it's very important that even if it isn't because of the university that students are less tolerant, uh, I think that the university, as you said, um, is not just supposed to be teaching, you know, skills to get a job, but it's also supposed to be teaching students to be tolerant of other opinions. I mean, that's where, where one of the big benefits that has always existed of universities. And so you're saying, well, students that uh, are saying, well, if I go to the university and I don't even get a job, um, why should I care if I become more tolerant of, of other people? Um, 
And, and I think, you know, you know, maybe that's the case. I think more so though, maybe it's that there maybe is a mindset change about, or has been a mindset change. I mean, not super recently, but going on for a while that I think some students maybe have not thought about the the wider purpose of going to a university and just thought about it as basically a, a training ground to get to get their job. And, and some of the things you see, I think, in trends of how universities have recruited students uh, have changed from when I went to college. So when I went to college, the tradition was you go to college and you figure it out after you're there for, you know, a year or two, you figure out what you're going to major and you take some classes, see what kinds of things you like, what kinds of things you don't like, and you don't, and then you decide. Now, every university is saying, tell us what your major is going to be from day one before you get there. And then we'll recruit you as an engineer or an economist or, you know, whatever the case may be. And so I think that that develops a mindset in students to think that the primary thing or the only thing maybe that I'm going to get out of university is this, you know, a job as an economist or an engineer. And they don't think about maybe, you know, the, the well-rounded, uh, you know, person that they're going to become from going to, or should become from going to university and their tolerance of different points of view. And I, that gets us back, I think, to the thing we talked about way at the beginning of the podcast when, you were talking about developing human capital skills that apply to not only a job, but apply to just living in society. Um, and, you know, why why aren't students, you know, going to see a Nobel Prize winner? And, and maybe it's just the mindset that, well, that's not going to help me get a job. But they're not thinking about maybe um, some of these other aspects of human capital that they're going to gain. And I think all of this is related to each other. So then I think you, you mentioned that they come in already intolerant, but it's the university's job to teach them tolerance. So I guess in part, this question is how do we create an institution or change the institution of universities, either on the books or in terms of culture to incentivize, and I don't, I don't like entirely to say incentivize, but to cultivate this air of tolerance, but also if it's more of a societal problem, how do you do that outside of the university too? I think the university is like a prime place to do it, but if we can't even do it there, <laughs> then what? Um. Yeah, yeah. No, I, no, those are two big questions uh, and and important questions. I mean, I think that at the university itself, I I think that one. I mean, some of the things we could do are just to uh, send a signal. I mean, one thing is you know students learn by example or people learn by example so you can tell them you know free speech is important and be tolerant of other points of view that's important but i think that it's important just to have an entire culture where people are demonstrating that they are tolerant of different points of view and speech um so i mean i think it's a matter of you know i mean one would just be to try to develop a culture of that but another thing would be you know, I mean, I think it would be useful at least to experiment. And I know some universities have started to experiment with this, but experiment with having, you know, a required course maybe for all students entering the university. Uh, they used to have a, a course at my university, which was like, a here's how to go to college uh, class. You know, here's how to study and things like that. They don't have that course anymore. But instead of having something like that, have a course that, you know, show students, here's the history of free speech, here's how it has helped marginalized groups, here's why it's important in society, here's why it's important at a university for critical thinking and advancing scientific knowledge. And then, uh, you know, and give students a, a, a an understanding of why we value free, free speech and why it needs to be an important part of the university and an important part of society. And I think about the the ex uh, University of Chicago president that that died, but he would, you know, all the students that would come into the university, he would tell them, you know, you're here to be unsettled. You're going to hear things that, you know, that make you uncomfortable. And this is not a place where you come to get away from those things, but it's a way, to, it, it's a place where you come to get exposed to those things. And so that's part of, 
you know, not just having it in a class, but if you have the university president telling the students, this is something we value, and then administration actually supporting that, um, the value of free speech by, you know, demonstrating it by, you know, standing behind professors or students that where there's attempt at canc cancellations or standing behind speaking events where there's attempted cancellations. I mean, those could go a long way, I, I think, potentially at universities. In terms of society, um, that's a much bigger issue. I think one of the things, you know, we think about our society as leaders as coming from universities with university training. I mean, I know not that's not completely true, but I mean, but I think if we can make a change in universities, that would go a big a long ways towards improving things in society because you know a lot of people in positions of authority are have university degrees and so the things that they learn or things that are, are reinforced at a university are going to carry on into their professional lives and into society in the future and so you know, even though I think these things are not necessarily started at universities, I think in many cases that they're reinforced. I mean, so, you know, we have, you know, safe spaces and other things, I think, that reinforce this idea that um, you shouldn't be exposed to other op other opinions that disagree with you. I mean, again, I don't think I, when I said that it doesn't come from a university, I think that it starts before a university, but I definitely think that universities play a role in maybe reinforcing the idea that that you don't have to be tolerant of other points of view. Are you optimistic? <laughs> yeah, it, do, it doesn't sound like it doesn't when I just said that. Actually, I actually I am optimistic because um, I, I do think that, you know, this is I mean, I'm right now emphasizing these problems and the negative side of them. But but I really I am optimistic because I I know that there are a lot of people that I mean for first of all over the world overall I'm optimistic about people's ability to innovate and and I do think that you know, people are generally good. I also am optimistic on this particular issue because I think that um, people are starting to wake up to it. I think that you know it's been a problem for a while, and I think people are starting to see maybe this showing up in it more in society. And so I, I'm optimistic that it's not something that we can't handle. And so, so yeah, I'm very optimistic because I've seen a lot of the good things that people are doing all over the country. I mean, just at universities, just one example is um, there was a incident just in the last year where students shouted down a speaker at Stanford law school and I mean, so that was a point where students were being very intolerant. But then, you know, the dean of their law school came out right away and said, we're going to make sure that all students now coming into the Stanford Law School are going to get some training in the importance of free speech. So, I mean, I think I, ju I just think there's all kinds of people doing really good things. Fire, Heterodox Academy, uh, Glenn Lowry, if you ever if you ever if you know Glenn Lowry or have heard his podcast, that he's somebody who's just uh, outstanding in terms of, you know, listening to other people and then not only, you know, people that maybe disagree with them completely, but he's somebody who's just a great um, demonstrator of the ability to listen to other people that maybe disagree with you and then respectfully maybe disagree with them or maybe consider some of the things that you didn't consider that they um, that are good points that they're making. And so um, I, I can just think of a lot of good people that are working to change this. And uh, and I am optimistic that it's going to improve. I think there's an element of there being a tension that actually makes optimism work, that, that is also what makes liberalism work, right? If we didn't, if we didn't run up against people not being optimistic or people not people people always being good and happy and sharing their ideas and loving dissenting opinions and everyone is perfectly optimistic in a way we'd have nothing to strive for and that's not to say that we should hope for a world where we don't have that it almost is to say that 
we're progressing to the point where we're dealing with things that we've never had to deal with before. And that it's almost the we're feeling the tension of progress, I think. Maybe that's not the way you should be putting it, but that's how I've been thinking about it recently. So, yeah, no, I, no, I think that's a, I think that's an excellent point. I think that is a one way to think about it. I I haven't thought about it that way, but it's, it's a good, it's an interesting point to contemplate. Okay, I have one last question for you, but thank you first for producing this amazing survey that has shocked. Um, <laughs> and also informed a lot of conversations and for coming on the podcast and sharing your wisdom. Um, what is, what is one thing you believed at one time in your life that you later changed your position on and why? Uh, yeah. So before, can I just say uh, one last thing about just optimism, just real yeah, quick? Of okay. course. Yes. So I was going to say, so that that's another thing I do want to mention is that the reason we're doing this survey is that, or that we have done this survey is that I am optimistic that we can do something. I mean, the point of the survey is to highlight, you know, what are the aspects of the problem right now so that we can do something about it. So if I didn't think we could do anything about it, there would be no, no point in doing the survey from my point of view, <laughs> but I do, but yeah. uh, in terms of ask, asking, you know, so what, what's one thing, um, you know, that, so again, the question is, what's one thing that you used to think that that I think differently about now? Yes. And so I think that's a great question. And I think it says a lot about you that you asked this question. I think it shows intellectual humility on your part or appreciation of intellectual humility. And that's one of the things that uh, I've learned as I get older is that there's less and less that I'm, you know, certain about. I think that there, there's, a, I realize that there are a lot of things that I don't know the older I get. And I think that it's very wise of you to, to understand that at a young age. And so um, if I were to think about, I mean, there's so, there have been a lot of things that I've changed my mind about uh, over time, but it's fresh in my memory, just from watching the Republican debate last week on, um, one of the questions asked about, you know, dealing with the drug problem um, and, you know, the reaction of a lot of the candidates was we need to go after the cartels. Um, and I, w I used to think that, you know, that was a good idea that supply side, you know, pro supply side approaches to the drug problem would work. I mean, obviously, I understand much more about economics than, than I used to um, at the time. And I realized that those approaches don't work. I mean, historically, if you look at the war on drugs has not been successful, but just also a better understanding of economics and understanding that, you know, demand for drugs tends to be very inelastic and that if you reduce supply, it's going to increase price a lot more than it reduces the quantity purchased by people. So it's just going to increase revenues for the the cartels, which gives them more resources to get around any kind of enforcement efforts that you have in place. And so, so one big thing that's changed for me is that I understand that the, those supply side approaches to dealing with the drug problem are probably not going to work. Um, but again, uh, I think it's great that you're asking a question like that. Once again, I'd like to thank my guests for their time and insight. I'd also like to thank you for listening to The Great Antidote podcast. It means a lot. The Great Antidote is sound engineered by Rich Goyette. If you have any questions, any guests, or topic recommendations, please feel free to reach out to me at greatantidote at libertyfund.org. Thank you.